My whole vision in life was to live on a deserted tropical South Pacific island. Watch out what you tell the Lord. <laughs> America tried to bury its toxic legacy here on a remote coral atoll. They covered it over with an 18-inch thick dome and left. Now the sea is rising and the dome is leaking. And the men who tried to clean it up are dying. I think it's a total secret. We didn't even know. The guys didn't know. We were lied to. Tonight, we journey to one of the most contaminated places on Earth and we meet the people fighting back. You know, if you accept that you're doomed, then what is left to fight for? You know, where are you going to find hope? We need the world to help us. Whatever the world is doing, please look at us. We're halfway between Australia and Hawaii, in the middle of a seemingly endless Pacific Ocean. Below us, chains of mostly uninhabited islands that together form the nation of the Marshall Islands. Well, we've just passed Bikini Atoll, known around the world for 23 atomic tests during the 1940s and 50s. But where we're going is much more remote, a place where nearly twice as many tests were carried out some the biggest in human history. Spread over two million square kilometres of the Central Pacific, the Marshall Islands is a scattering of more than a thousand islands and islets. Few people have heard of Eniwetok, but it's the ground zero of US nuclear testing in the Pacific. The welcome sign hints at what we've come to see, but when you know what it really is, few would want to visit this place. This atoll is a ring of 40 islands, so remote that there's no regular transport in or out. It'll be a week before our plane returns, if we're lucky. It's a stunning place, but its beauty hides a dark, dirty secret. This is a place whose atomic past is seared into its present. The people of Eniwetok were forced into exile by the atomic fallout. Allowed to return after three decades, a new generation is learning about the traditions and customs of this place. They have also been taught about America's toxic legacy and how it lies under a giant dome. They understand. Somehow they understand that we have a bison in our island. That is what they call bison. They know that there is a doom because they have been there. So the dome, you call it the tomb? Mm, we call it the tomb. We set out the next morning to see for ourselves. To do that, we need guides who know how to navigate the reefs and the World War II wrecks that lie in Eniwetok shallows. To get to where we're going, we have to cross the world's second largest ocean lagoon, formed by the rim of an ancient volcano. It's a thousand square kilometres of the Pacific. After nearly two hours, we approach one of Eniwetok Atoll's 40 islands, a tiny, scrubby rise called Runet. What we've come to see is hard to spot from the beach, 
Only from the air can you get a true sense of the size and the scale of what the United States military calls the dome. The dome is actually a dump. It contains the toxic leftovers of some of the most powerful atomic bombs in history, America's Cold War legacy. It is a tomb of nuclear waste. The dome is completely uh, unlabeled. There's no fence, there are no guards there. People can go there if they want, and there's nobody to stop them. Like other former nuclear test sites in the Marshall Islands, Runet Island is officially off limits. But there's no one here to stop us when we visit. This place is just too isolated to guard. From 1946 to 1958, the United States detonated dozens of atomic bombs in the Marshall Islands. And while Eniwetok is hardly known, its closest neighbour, 300 kilometres to the east, became synonymous with nuclear fallout. Its name is Bikini. On Bikini Island, over three miles from the point of birth, on the water you can see the shockwave coming toward the camera. Watch those palm trees in the foreground. I'm from Bikini Atoll. Right now, I don't think I'll be able to go back. I mean, it's just not clean enough for us. It's not safe. One of the country's last traditional navigators, Alson Kellum, is adrift, living in exile because he's not allowed to return home to Bikini. Ahead of the atomic testing there in the 1940s, the United States told Alson Kellum's family and the 167 people of his atoll that they had a duty to the world to leave their islands. It was a moment filmed by the military's PR unit. Scene 26, take two. All right now, James, will you tell them that the United States government now wants to turn this great destructive force into something good for mankind, and that this experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction. Already good, and they're willing to go, and everything is God hand. Well, you tell them in King Judah that everything being in God's hands, it cannot be other than good. And here, by the way, you hear them singing a, their Marshallese version of You Are My Sunshine. The Islanders are a nomadic group and are well pleased that the Yanks are going to add a little variety to their lives. Alison Kellen's 93-year-old aunt was one of those who was put on a boat and taken off her island. Seven decades later, the pain of forced exile is not eased. Every day she says, when are we going back? And I keep saying, oh, one day, I don't know when, but one day. But I know, I know for a fact that we're not going back. So it really, really made me sad because I don't know what to tell her. Should I lie to her? I mean, it's not her fault, but I don't want to lie to her. Hundreds of Marshallese were shifted off their islands by the United States. Some, like Lemweo Abon, after it was too late. In March 1954, her island was enveloped in the fallout from one of the bikini blasts. Codenamed Castle Bravo, it was the biggest nuclear test ever carried out by the United States, a thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. The earth shook. Yeah, when, when we saw the bright light and, and the loud sound, 
Most of us were very afraid. We were afraid. And we just sit down and see what will happen next. A few hours later, 14-year-old Limueo noticed white powder falling from the sky. Some of the kids, they didn't know what snow is, so they named that. Oh, the snow is fell down. <laughs> this is the first time we just saw this, yeah. The snow was highly radioactive fallout from the Castle Bravo bomb. It took days for the Americans to evacuate them. The survivors remain nuclear refugees to this day. The meteorologists had predicted a wind condition which should have carried the fallout to the north of the group of small atolls lying to the east of Bikini. The wind failed to follow the predictions, but shifted south of that line, and the little islands of Ronjalap, Ronjerik, and Uteric were in the edge of the path of the fallout. The medical staff on Kwajalein have advised us that they anticipate no illness, barring, of course, diseases which may be hereafter contracted. Jack Needenthal washed up here in the Marshall Islands capital, Majuro, more than 30 years ago and never left. Now the head of the country's Red Cross, he has spent decades fighting for nuclear justice for the people of Bikini Atoll, even taking their fight for compensation to Washington. As children, you don't open up your, your history books and see a word about Bikini and the nuclear testing out here, even though in my belief, the Cold War was literally fought and won on the shores of Bikini. I mean, there were 23 weapons tested up there, 20 of them were hydrogen bombs. I mean, the people of Bikini did do a lot for mankind. I mean, even now these days, you have the North Korean leader talking about exploding a hydrogen bomb over the Pacific like it's nothing. The idea that they're even playing around with words and, and notions like that is so insulting and so infuriating to the people who live out here and have been through this and have suffered for since the 40s and 50s. It's, it's really awful for us to hear that. Scientists term the experiment an entire success, a success in destruction. As the smoke rises on Aniwitok, the curtain rises on the seeds of man's oblivion. The impacts of 12 years of nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands included increased rates of thyroid and other cancers and the permanent exile of people from their home islands. In 1986, as part of a deal to give the Marshall Islands independence, the US paid $150 million. Later, an independent tribunal awarded more than $2 billion to victims of the testing program. Less than $4 million was ever paid. The tribunal office in the capital, Majuro, is no longer operating, with most claims unresolved, sitting in files gathering dust. The US government policy on the nuclear weapons legacy in the Marshall Islands is to simply downgrade and dismiss health hazards as non-existent or insignificant. Giff Johnson is the publisher of the Marshall Islands Journal, the country's only newspaper. For three decades, he's been a passionate advocate for the local people. His wife, Darlene Keiju, was a famous nuclear survivor and Marshallese leader who died of cancer, aged just 45. It really makes us wonder if Marshall Islanders will ever get justice uh, from the nuclear weapons tests that were conducted here. And justice is the right word. It's really important to understand that, that a lot of nuclear contaminated material was tossed into a crater left over from a bomb test, a coral atoll, essentially. And a coral atoll, by its nature, is porous. When the US was getting ready to clean up and leave in the late 1970s, they picked the pit that had been left by one of the smaller atomic explosions and uh, dumped a lot of this plutonium and other radioactive waste into the pit and covered it over with an 18-inch thick dome and left. That dome lies 1,100 kilometres to the west of the capital, Majuro. Like Bikini Atoll, this place is deemed 
too hot in radioactive terms for human habitation. People in the United States would not tolerate something like this in their own backyard right now, or, or any time. That's why it's up there. It's astounding that it is there. But when you go out there, it's, it's very surreal. I mean, to me, it's like this big monument to America's giant fuck-up. The dome was never meant to be anything but a temporary solution to the problem of atomic waste. At almost every stage of its construction, safety was sacrificed to save money. Michael Gerard is a US climate change specialist who's visited the dome. The bottom of the dome is just what was left behind uh, by the nuclear weapons explosion. Uh, it's permeable soil. There was no effort to line it, and therefore the seawater is inside the dome. Already the sea sometimes washes over it in a, in a large storm, and the United States government has acknowledged that a major typhoon could break it apart and cause all of the radiation in it to disperse. You can see why Runet's remoteness made it seem like a good place for the dome and its contaminated contents. But like most of the islands of the Marshalls, Runet is barely a metre above sea level at its highest point. When this dome was built in the late 1970s, there was no factoring in sea level rises caused by climate change. Now, every day when the tide rolls out, as it is now, radioactive isotopes from underneath the dome roll out with it. That dome is the connection between the nuclear age and the climate change age. It'll be a very devastation uh, even if it really leaks. We're not talking just the Marshall Islands. We're talking the whole Pacific Ocean. I think it's really telling that that the ocean is rising and it's, and, it's, and it's making this nuclear waste leak out because in a lot of ways, this climate change issue has also been revi revitalizing a lot of conversations about our nuclear legacy. Every time someone talks about climate change, you can't ignore our nuclear legacy as well. It's linked. Kathy Jetnell Kijner is a poet and climate change activist. She's proud of her Marshallese heritage. It's my home, it's where I'm from, it's where my family's from, my ancestors. They've been here for thousands of years and, and there's also just nothing like it anywhere else. And uh, it's a part of who I am. A rising leader of her nation, Kathy Jetnell Kijner was invited to the 2014 United Nations Climate Change Summit in New York to speak about how the Marshall Islands is on the front line in the battle against rising sea levels. The Marshall Islands encompasses more than two million square kilometers of ocean. I mean, it's the United Nations. These are world leaders from all over. And it was the first time that I was able to share something that I, was, I cared about, you know, something about the islands. And what she shared was a poem about climate change, Do a poem to addressed to her infant daughter. You are a seven-month-old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. You are thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Mata Felibanum, I want to tell you about that lagoon, that lazy lounging lagoon lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. Dear Mata Felibinum, don't cry. Mommy promises you no one will come and devour you. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's going to become a climate change refugee. In a place known for sober speeches and poker face diplomacy, Kathy Jetnell Kijner's pledge to her daughter to fight climate change moved many to tears. I mean, when they all stood up, I kind of thought they were just being polite, but I just found out later that that's not, that doesn't happen all the time.
Some estimates put the sea level rise here in excess of 60 centimetres by the end of this century. That's enough to inundate three quarters of the country. Now we're on alert every time there's a high tide because the water will come over and flood our houses, you know, crash against homes, it'll destroy homes, it'll dry the crops and, you know, that didn't ever happen before. You know, we're getting a lot of more extreme weathers like droughts too. And so it's just gotten a lot worse in the past couple of years. It will kill our reef. So if it kills our reef, it kills our fish, it kills our food. And you know Marshall has a very, very limited land. So there's really nothing for us to uh, survive on. So I would, you know, I would say the very, very short time. I, I cannot give you the year, but it, we will gradually probably start moving out soon. So the clock is ticking before you have it, to relocate? It is, it is ticking. I drive my grandson to school every day. He's eight years old. And we talk about this stuff. Why do you think the climate's changing? Why do you think things are so different now? Ice. Yeah, the ice is melting. And that's causing the seas to rise. And the Marshall Islands are very low. Jack Needenthal argues that rising seas are a bigger threat to his island home and to his grandson's future than atomic bombs ever were. I'm telling him, your life is going to be really hard, a lot harder than my life was. And the place that you love is going to be slowly disappearing, and it's going to be up to people of your generation to fight back on this. And he, he gets that. Everywhere is the coast, because there's some parts of the island that are so thin that there's ocean on either side of you. We're just surrounded by ocean, and I don't think the ocean has ever looked as big to me until I came back home after living out in the States. Yeah. In recent years, late winter king tides have swept over some islands, choking crops with salt and even wrecking homes. The flooding could contaminate the country's shallow freshwater aquifers, and sewage-filled tides threaten outbreaks of fever and dysentery. And according to the locals, it's becoming much more frequent. We would go years in between seeing uh, big, big inundation incidents. And since about 2008, uh, it's increased with regularity uh, to the point where, I mean, we'll have six, eight of these in a year. Not even the dead have been spared. Here, graves have been smashed and washed out to sea. In 2014, a state of emergency was declared when five-metre swells smashed over the shoreline. The US Geological Survey warns that many Pacific atolls, like those in the Marshall Islands, will be uninhabitable within decades. The Marshall Islands are in grave danger. There are already a lot of people who are leaving the Marshall Islands. A lot of them go to Hawaii or to mainland United States. Some of them go elsewhere. Uh, but the long-term future of the Marshall Islands is not bright. I would say that our country is sinking. Our country is the front line, so we're facing the devastating effect of climate change. And we need the world to help us. People of Bikini got relocated from their atolls because of nuclear. Today, we're about to get relocated, not from our island, but from our country. So whatever the world is, look, is doing, please look at us. For many Marshallese, the dome on Runet Island remains a potent symbol of the threat of climate change. It may be made from half-metre thick concrete panels, but as we've seen elsewhere, the ocean is likely to win out over concrete every time. The radiation levels of the people of Enewetok are supposed to be monitored here, in this space-aged US-built lab on the main island. But when we visit, the machine for assessing radioactive exposure isn't working. 
The US government prohibits the export of food from Eniwetok because of the concerns about contamination. Fish from here is also banned. But this atoll surrounds a calm lagoon, and the lure of fresh fish is too much to resist, despite the lingering radiation. And as we're about to find out, it's not just the people of the Marshall Islands who are living with the fallout from what happened here all those years ago. This was the site of the largest nuclear cleanup in United States history. 4,000 young soldiers toiled here for years to fill in the bomb crater underneath this dome. Among the more than 80,000 cubic metres of contaminated soil and debris was plutonium, one of the most toxic substances on the planet. For many of the young soldiers who worked here, there was a high price to pay. Those young men are now in their 50s and 60s, and few in the United States know their story. From the islands and atolls of the Marshall Islands, I've come to the deserts of Nevada, another place where the United States tested many of its atomic weapons. In fact, you could see the mushroom clouds from the Nevada test site 100 kilometres away in Las Vegas. And that's where I'm headed today, to meet one of Enuitak's atomic cleanup veterans. The suburban sprawl of Las Vegas feels like another world away from the remote emptiness of Enuitok Atoll. But the dome is something former US soldier Jim Androll can never forget, and neither can he forgive. I had never even heard of Enuitok. I never knew that there were 43 nuclear tests out there. I didn't know it was radioactive. They didn't tell us so we landed. Uh, everybody kind of pretty much flipped out uh, when they found out. Uh, because it was radioactive? Because it was radioactive. I was told I was going to visit a tropical paradise for the last six months of the service. A specialist in the Army's 84th Engineer Battalion, Jim Androll was one of thousands of US soldiers sent to help clean up Enuitok Atoll in the 1970s. A thousand workers from the US Armed Forces are giving the Northern Islands a facelift, striving to dig and scrape away the radioactive soil and debris. This US news story shows soldiers on Enuitok wearing radiation suits. But Jim Androll says this was just a show for the TV cameras. There was no special gear issued. We were um, just issued our normal uh, warm weather gear, which would have been shorts, t-shirts, hats, and, and uh, jungle boots, and that's it. And were you given radioactive decontamination track? No, none whatsoever. Was there any safety equipment? No. Nope. If people do come back to Runit Island, they'll be risking perhaps the hottest radiation on Earth. This island won't be fit for human habitation again for at least 24,000 years. On Runit Island, site of the dome, soldiers were exposed to one of the most toxic substances known, the result of a bomb test gone wrong. One of the attempted nuclear weapons explosions didn't work. And so the plutonium, rather than having a, a nuclear blast, was just broken apart by the conventional explosions, uh, leading to a, um, about 400 little chunks of plutonium that were spread all around the atoll. Those 400 chunks were put in plastic bags and tossed into the crater underneath the dome. Well, they'd have us round up, walk around and pick up loose pieces. Uh, for instance, and just gather up whatever we could, throw it in a pile. And I, I never had any clue that dust could literally get into your lungs. But these guys were dealing with that every day. All of us were. We all were. Declassified US government documents revealed that Washington knew the troops would be exposed to plutonium on Runet Island. This secret cable from 1972 talks about the existence of solid plutonium-bearing chunks on the island's surface. It warned that the quantity of plutonium was undoubtedly large and that it presented a new and serious concern. Many of the US soldiers in particular who worked at Anahuitoc have since come down with uh, illnesses that they say were caused by their work there. Jim Androll is one of those soldiers. For years, he suffered from a myriad of complaints he says are linked to his service on Enuitok. 
He had his gallbladder out. Shortly after that, they found a seven and a half pound tumor, cancerous tumor in his abdomen. I suffer from roughly 40 to 45 residuals from the cancer. I've got uh, pancreatitis. I've got a spot on my liver that they're watching, kidneys. The problem for former cleanup workers like Jim Androll is that unlike the other US soldiers involved in the atomic tests, the government does not recognize them as atomic veterans. This means the 4,000 cleanup veterans have no special health care coverage. Many are lumbered with crippling medical bills. Washington argues safety precautions on Inuitok were exemplary, that workers' radiation exposure fell below recommended limits, and that their illnesses and the time they spent on Inuitok are not linked. I mean, these people were in the army. What choice did they have? They were told, go clean up Inuitok. They went. Uh, I think mostly they're trying to get health coverage, medical care, uh, because they've got just, uh, some of them have terrible bills, uh, really high bill, bills from, uh, from hospitals because of their treatment. There has never been a formal study of the health of Inuitok workers, but one informal survey reported that hundreds suffered problems such as cancers, brittle bones, and birth defects in their children. Hey, How are you? How's it going? I didn't think I'd be seeing you in hospital. Are you OK? <laughs> yeah, yeah. a little bus up. Take us, take, sit down, man. Are you, uh, how are you feeling? Uh, strange. The, uh, I might have had some damages done to another part of my body when yeah. they were putting in the uh, stomach aneurysm. And a we talk veteran, Ken Cassick, knows all about hospital bills. We meet in Hawaii. Although by the time I arrive, Ken has been rushed to intensive care with a brain aneurysm. As a 24-year-old, he was working at a US Air Force base in Hawaii when he was asked if he was interested in running the military exchange on an idyllic Pacific atoll called Inuitok. Oh, sign me up. That's it. I'm gone. My whole vision in life was to live on a deserted, tropical South Pacific island. Watch out what you tell the Lord. <laughs> It came through. This would be no posting to paradise. Not long after arriving on Inuitok, Ken Cassick realised he was living and working in the middle of a massive nuclear cleanup, one centred on the dome on Runet Island. It was a very dirty operation. And the same vehicles that transported this filthy, 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 horrible atomic waste to Runet, the boys are on these boats. You can see this crap going on their faces and on their bodies. You know, you cannot get away from it. Like Jim Androll, Ken Cassick says he was never given any safety gear or training. He says the thousands of young men sent into the cleanup had no idea of what they were exposed to. It's a total secret. We didn't even know. The guys didn't know. None of those guys would, would be in an area that's so contaminated if they knew about it. We were lied to. And our boys work six-month tours on a dirty island. And the government says you were never there. Ken Cassick has undergone nearly 40 surgeries for cancerous lesions, which he blames on his time on Inuitok. But he and Jim Androll count themselves lucky, saying many of their comrades died young and in terrible pain. The radiation is killing everybody. God, there's been so many. Uh, we just lost one two weeks ago. We lost one about six months before that. Um, they told me I'd be dead by now. Kenny's supposed to have been dead by now. Jim Androll's wife, Bev, is now helping the Inuitok veterans battle for justice, both in the corridors of Washington and on social media. Most of these men we have never met in our lives, but they're like our brothers. We love these guys. And, you know, they're dying at, before they're 60. It's, it's ridiculous. There's nobody trained in the, the atomic waste. There's people trained in the, the actual making of the bombs, testing the bombs and all like that, but not picking it up. You cannot get rid of this. The island should just be destroyed. Wherever his work took him around the world, Ken Cassick always returned here to his Hawaiian home. These days, restricted to a hospital bed, 
you rarely get to enjoy its beauty and lifestyle. It's been four decades since he first left here for his adventure on Enoetok, and Ken Cassick is haunted both mentally and physically by the dome. America dumped all of their worst rubbish to the Marshallese and abandoned them with it. And we don't want to hear about it. It's a disgusting shame. And it, it, uh, it looks, it makes us look bad. And thus the natives express to the people of the United States their welcome in their simplicity and their pleasantness and their courtesy. They're more than willing to cooperate although they don't understand the world of nuclear energy any more than we do. Runa Dome embodies injustices in many different ways. The fact that all these weapons were exploded there, the fact that this plutonium was left behind, the fact that the workers who worked there have not been compensated, and very importantly, the fact that the entire nation is endangered by sea level rise, which is caused mostly by the greenhouse gas emissions of the major emitting countries, of which the U.S. was historically number one. These are an accumulation of injustices. The last couple of years when people would come and they wanted to talk about the nuclear legacy, I said, the nuclear legacy is is not as devastating and is almost not as important as climate change. Because if I'm a Marshall Islander and I have a, an island that has radiation on it and has the hope of someday being mitigated or rehabilitated, if I have a choice between that island and one that's underwater forever, I'll take the radioactive island every time because there's still hope in that. Once these islands go underwater, they aren't coming back. The Marshall Islands may be damned either way, because Michael Gerrard says even if the dome is smashed apart in a Pacific storm, it may make little difference to the environment outside. I'm persuaded that the radiation outside the dome is as bad as the radiation inside the dome. And therefore, it is a tragic irony uh, that the US government may be right that if this material were to be released, that the already bad state of the environment uh, around there wouldn't get that much worse. The Marshall Islands isolation made it ideal for a superpower to test the most destructive weapons in history. And now its survival is threatened yet again by the actions of much larger nations thousands of kilometres away. These are situations where the Marshallese people are almost are either guinea pigs or they're just seen as disposable. We're seen as disposable in both of these situations. We're disposable. Our lives don't matter. The war matters. Nuclear bombs matter. Our lives don't matter. Oil matters. Money matters. Gas matters. You know, uh, profits matter. Kathy Jetnil Kijina is determined that her child will not become a climate change refugee. I don't think we're doomed, and I also can't accept that. You know, if you accept that you're doomed, then what is left to fight for? You know, where are you going to find hope? A lot of people describe our islands as drowning, but we like to say that you know we're fighting. We're not just drowning. There are thousands out on the street marching hand in hand, chanting for change now, and they're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us, because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Matafele Binum, you are eyes heavy with drowsy weight, so just close those eyes and sleep in peace, because we won't let you down. You'll see.
St. Petersburg has seen empires rise and fall. A hundred years ago, a revolution toppled the last Tsar. Today, many want to oust the president they call the new Tsar. They're an army of young activists desperate to bring in a new age. They're putting their faith in a charismatic but controversial challenger. So has the Russian strongman finally met his match? We've come on a very special day to find out. I love St. Petersburg. Thank you.